Welcome to the Parenting in the Digital Age podcast. Many parents are concerned that their child might be falling behind. Others are just looking for ways to help their children thrive, not just in the classroom, but socially and well into their future careers. Each episode, we explore the challenges facing parents in the modern world, from behavior, education, and nutrition, to device and gaming addiction. We interview a range of leaders in the area of childhood development to help you successfully navigate parenting in the digital age. Here is your host, Jamie Buttigieg. Hello, parents, and welcome to the Parenting in the Digital Age podcast, where we explore the challenges and opportunities of raising kids in a world filled with technology. Now, for many parents, the way we entertain our children can be a concern. Are they spending too much time in front of their devices? Are they learning the right lessons and being exposed to the right things? Today's guest, Ross Fisher, is the author and creator of the Bobby and Morph stories, which aim to bridge this gap. The collection includes important morals and lessons in the children's lives in the style of a classic. Chapters explore subjects such as thinking of others, the importance of being polite, and even the value of tidy up time, which would be a godsend to most parents. Now, Ross, welcome to the show. Before we dig in, can you please share with our listeners what you do and what you are passionate about? Well, thanks for having me on, Jamie. Um, What I do and what am I passionate about, so... um, the, the Bobby and Wolf project, as I'd like to kind of coldly call it, which is <laughs> a bit unfair, but um, was something that was born out of frustration, really. Um, I'm a, I work in marketing and I'm a, I'm a writer, really, by by day. And uh, this this project was a hobby that's kind of got out of control. Um, it was a series of stories that I jotted down um, out of frustration, really. Um, I was looking to buy a story or a book for um, a friend of the family who, uh, who had a little one growing up, uh, turning five I think at the time, and I wandered into the bookshop and yeah, I, 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 all, all, all that was on offer was either stories like the classics that we all know, which are Beatrix Potter and Winnie the Pooh, uh, Paddington Bear, etc, etc, which are quite literary. 100 years old or it was a little bit Rackham and Stackham kind of celebrity endorsed throw throw away stories and um, I just thought there had to be something else out there that would kind of be a nod to the nod to the uh, the classics but something that could stand up in modern day um, and and I wanted to mirror the, the, the stuff that my mum taught me growing up and I'm sure many, many, many parents you know, want to teach their children as well, which is the basic moral standings of just being a, being a nice person. Yeah, indeed. Um, and that can be frustrating for parents as well, trying to find books that align with their values or that even teach these values that aren't just, uh, uh, as you said, throwaway stories. So tell us a little bit more before we uh, dive too deep. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Bobby and Morph and uh, their unique personalities. Oh, where do I begin? So, uh, are you a pet owner yourself, Jamie? Or I, 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 I am. I'm, I'm a uh, proud father of two Dachshunds. So, uh, oh. we, we're a sausage dog family here. <laughs> amazing, amazing. <laughs> so, I've grown up with, uh, with animals, not just dogs, but animals all my life, generally. And, and they've all been... Uh, rescue animals so they've been adopted um, you know, because of various circumstances or whatever so you'll know as well that these these animals these pets they have they do have their own personalities of their own and when I was writing the stories or essentially just making making up any kind of uh, narrative at the beginning I, I needed to yeah base it around two characters and, and Bobby and Wolf were both um, two two dogs that we had, that I had growing up, uh, whose personalities hopefully are reflected in the book. But they you know, Bobby was was a very unfortunately neither of them are with us anymore. So Bobby was a small kind of like terrier type, um, yeah, terrier Scotty dogish kind of kind of dog, um, and he was very cocksure of himself, quite confident, 
very, very friendly and you just kind of fell in love with him the moment you saw him kind of thing, just the way that just the way that he was. Um and Morph he was he was actually a, a staff a staffy, staffordship all terrier. And um just a bit dopey, a bit dopey, um, heart of gold, didn't mean to uh, you know, to knock anything over or anything like that. There was no not a bad bone in his body. So I just felt that both those kind of characters not only complemented each other, but also would have would appeal to, to anybody. To anybody. And I just wanted to reflect that within the stories themselves. Yeah, I love that. And and uh, I more than anyone know the uh, personalities or the, the pets have and uh, they are all so different um, so can you share any uh, anecdotes about how your stories have positively impacted a child or a parent's life and uh, you know maybe just talk talk uh, give, give parents a sense of some of the morals or values that they might find ca- contained within these books yeah of course I mean the the, the, the book itself is made up of 10 uh, individual stories um, and funny enough funny that you should mention it actually because I had some feedback uh, from an old colleague of mine uh, only, only just last week who dropped me a message online and said oh my god you know I've, um, I was dropping off my three year old at a nursery and um, the Bobby and Wolf book was, was used as an example as a uh, moral rich as a moral rich book example to, to teach kids about about doing the right thing and kindness and well, I, I, I kind of blew me away really because I can I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But um, yeah, each of the stories has an individual moral, and the golden thread that goes through all ten stories is is kindness and doing the right thing. So, for example, um, in the first in the first story, uh, it's about thinking of others. Where uh, Bobby and Wolf they walk past. Um, a homeless person and ask the questions that probably that kids ask parents or you know ask around of you know why are they on that why are they homeless how are they like that what why aren't we how can we help um, and it's about you yeah, know thinking of others and and um, taking the blinkers off really uh, yeah. Being a bit more human, adding the human value to it, which is what kids do. You know, I've, I've been in, I've been in schools and done readings, and the when you read other stories. So, for instance, so that that that's the first one. Um, that explores, uh, like I said, it explores thinking of others. You've got um, second one, which is where they help. It's called Bob, when Bobby and Wolf help the mayor with a magic scarf. And that is uh, a story where they explore the uh, the importance of being kind and and being polite. So your please and thank yous, and how people's attitudes change towards you when you are nicer to them and, and more polite. Um, but when I did a reading at at the schools, it was it was great because come break time, I'm having a cup of tea and kind of prepping myself for our for the next session of kids coming in that I can read to and there was a handful of them in the playground and they were playing a game but uh, playing a game that, that involved saying please all the time, only please, they just latched onto that word <laughs> but um, it was about saying please all the time and I just thought well if anything that's, that's the positive thing I can take from it but um, I like I'd, I'd like um, I, I, I do. I love stories like that growing up, and I think that the stories that I that were told to me were yes of the classics, but I really, really enjoyed, and I suppose what stayed with me was stories that tackled subjects and topics that are, that are really difficult ones to do. So, um, Mog the Cat, for instance. Um, the, the last one, the last one in the series that that uh, that was written was um, explore explores the loss, and I think it's I think it's called when 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 Mog said says goodbye or something, and I mean that is a that's probably the hardest subject of all to tackle, which is losing somebody that you love or or somebody within your family 
goes away and doesn't come back anymore. Um, and it's those kind of it, those kind of stories and, and morals really that explain difficult subjects um, in a in a in a thoughtful and sensitive way. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but to bring it, sorry to bring it up a little bit more, so <laughs> I don't want to put it down on it. But the, to, to bring things up a little bit more, it's it's um, yeah. The, the, the stories of the, the morals within my stories are yeah, certainly thinking of others, but it's about other important things that I think uh, children today are perhaps maybe struggling with. So uh, it's being comfortable in your own skin, sharing. Being able to forgive each other when something goes wrong, um, and these are these are things that I think the parents have at the forefront of their minds um, that they worry about in you know, in the age of social media and so much influence around them. Um, that yeah, it's it's uh, hopefully a nice um, nostalgic crutch that they can use um, yeah. to to not only limit their the kids' screen time. Um, because look, we, we all understand that it, it's the age we live in, right? And there's no getting away from it. Um, and I know, I know that some parents may feel a little bit guilty at times that they that they kind of rely sometimes on on a on a smart device to put in front of their children to keep them occupied. But I'm just trying to show that there is a um, there is also another way, or there is still room for for the old the older more traditional things which is connecting through storytelling and um through reading together yeah yeah you're right and uh you know as a father and as now a grandfather as an educator um you know i'm always looking for opportunities to you know help uh my own kids and and those that i am responsible for to um, become better citizens just become better people you know yeah. and uh, to, to grow up the right way it's a no-brainer, right? So we, we all want our children and we want ourselves to do the right thing and think of the right thing. Um, it's and, and constantly looking for ways of how do we teach that. Well, you know, I, th I think, to be brutally honest with you, Jamie, the, the, the easiest way of doing it is 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 by a certain example, isn't it? And But we're all human and I understand that, that you know, we do sometimes shout, there was say sometimes we swear, you know, and do things that maybe we go, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that in front of them or whatever. Um, we've all and we're all victims of it ourselves, right? You know, yeah. everyone's human, but I think it's it's showcasing that human side in a way that uh, yeah that enables us to, like you say, be better citizens. I think I think is the right thing. Yeah, definitely, and I, and I can see myself using stories uh you know much like your own to um teach the the moral or teach the values that we're trying to teach uh, and then when as parents when we identify those behaviors or you know, and see them being displayed we want to recognize and reward them right like we want that's it's kind of like the next step so it's, it's one thing as parents or an educator to read this book to some kids but you know how do we then take that and actually use it as a lesson or, or, or give it a practical benefit uh, to teach our kids. Um, and, and I think um, we, we do it in our own classrooms as well. When we see somebody, uh, you know, one student helping another, you know, they're showing generosity. They'll get a sticker that, you know, displays generosity. Um, if, if a student stands up for another student, they're showing courage. And we'll often just, uh, you know, and, and, and I think for, for me, you know, I look at my job as uh, one that supports parents. So, you know, kids... Uh, parents trust their kids to come to our learning centre. We want to support them, not just through coding and STEM education, but we want to support them uh, in, in, in helping them build um, uh, great values, great morals, uh, and, and like I said earlier, just become better people. Um, and, uh, yeah, we take that responsibility pretty seriously. So what uh, with so much technology available, getting to the next question, um, how can parents encourage their kids to enjoy reading, you know, maybe instead of some of these forms of traditional, uh, uh, you know, digital technology? Um, I suppose, I suppose it's, um, it's getting back to that encouragement and uh, yeah, encouragement of, of using your imagination. Um, we do, 
at playtime, um, I, I, I know it's thing times have changed and kids unfortunately don't necessarily uh, play out together as much as maybe they did when when we were a lot younger. Um, uh, supervision is absolute key, I think, in parenting today. Um, purely because of the information that our kids are are you know subjected to every single day, so there has to be supervision. But I think that by harnessing and encouraging imaginations via via books and reading, and and more importantly, reading together is um, is bigger. Because read, reading together is, it doesn't matter if it's if it's digitally or whether it's book in hand, to be perfectly honest with you. But building that connection of reading together and falling in love with 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 storytelling and, and and stuff like that is, I think, is goes hand in hand with harnessing imaginations and, and encouraging those imaginations. I think that uh, you know it's kind of as old as the invention of television, isn't it? That cartoons, you know, oh my God, you can't put your kids in front of cartoons all day, every day. It, you know, it's terrible for them. That's, that's not necessarily true. Um, but I do think that um, it, it doesn't leave a lot to the imagination. And when yeah. you're reading together and you're exploring different topics and stuff, you can, it encourages not just the, the child, but also the, the parent or guardian that's with them to ask their own unique questions and and explore their own thoughts because out of out of whatever the subject is a, a, a child will, will will naturally have a question about something and yeah. even relate it to something in their lives and that's what encourages uh, that interaction whatever you want to call it between the parent guardian and the child but the, the great thing is is that it's it's encouraging the child to think for themselves and and explore topics that are maybe hard for for us to explore normally yeah very true and uh, one of the other neat ways that i've seen parents encourage kids towards reading particularly physical books um, uh, our daughter's created a book nook it's just a, an area in the house in the playroom so to speak but a whole corner dedicated to books, like it looks like a little library where they can go in there and they have, you know, daily reading time in there. And part of our responsibility, I think, as parents is to is to model that. Uh, and I think you touched on something earlier, um, Ross, where, um, uh, you know, we've got to model that behaviour. We've got to be seen to have a book in our own hand. If kids never see that, they're never going to, you know, display that or, or look look for books and, and find interest or that love or passion. Um you know, and sometimes another way we can do that is just to find um, other alternatives to screens. You know, for me, look, I'm not so much a visual learner, but I'm an auditory learner. And, and I've got to say, I'm not a big book reader. But in actual case, in actual fact, I am. Like, I listen to audio books and I digest audio. I chew through them daily uh, on my morning walk, in the car, uh, between audio books and podcasts. I'm, I'm hungry for learning. And I think parents need to also acknowledge that too. If your child is you know, perhaps not uh, gravitating towards books um, that, you know, explore other uh, other forms of reading. It's still reading. It's still uh, helping them learn. Um, and uh, we were actually playing a great game the other day. Oh, I've got, this is not a plug, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I don't know who these guys are, but I got served this really uh, neat ad on Instagram. It's called Outsmarted. Uh, and I got this ad on Instagram, and uh, I'm a bit of an impulsive shopper. So within 30 seconds, I had ordered this Outsmarter game because it, it, it to me came across as a way that it would bridge the gap between me and my own kids. And what it is, it's a, it's a ball game like the old Trivial Pursuit, except every, everyone downloads the questions or the app to their phone. And so we're sitting around the board game, playing a physical board game with, with one another. So we're interacting on that human level. Uh, but uh, all the questions are done via the app and uh, it keeps score and so on and so forth. So it's just a neat way to bridge technology and bring people together in an age where we're becoming increasingly less social. Yeah, and I, I, I understand that, um, that the way that we consume stuff is, is, is changed um, from... You know, even 
10 years ago. It's happened so quickly, such as the, the, you know, the ever evolving, constantly evolving technology roundabout that we're on. But, um, uh, which, which brings me on to using or harnessing or trying to bridge that gap, like you said, between the, between the, the more old school methods, right. And bringing them into um, a, a, a digital age, I think. More importantly for me, or the way that I see uh, the Bobby and Wolf stories evolving, is how much more can it be made accessible to to everybody. Um, that's not just children either, but um, anybody that has, I don't know, maybe a, a, a reading difficulty, or maybe reading isn't there, uh, doesn't float their boat because they find it difficult. It could be dyslexia, it could be you know, obviously a form of autism or something like that. Um, because I'm very conscious that I don't want to, com I, I'm not shunning, we can't shun, it's a shun, can't shun uh, technology full stop because, um, yeah, we uh, we all know the perils and the, and the pitfalls of what can be consumed online and, and maybe what we do in our own lives anyway as adults, but also it can be used as a very, very powerful tool. And when we go into the age of, Web three, as it were, and, and artificial intelligence, and everyone's minds being blown at the moment by by chatbots and their and their abilities to solve and answer questions at absolute millisecond speeds, and it's it's incredible. But it's I'm now starting to look at well, how can we harness that to to you know further further enhance the the stories. The stories and the books and the messaging so it's funny you should say about the board game because that's that's that is quite literally a physical board game that you have to log with your with your app or your smart device i'm starting to look at or if somebody has got a copy of the book or wish to get a copy of the book how can we use technology whether that is an app or augmented reality or whatever you want to call it that you can scan the pages or you can read the stories and it automatically um, converts, it to, to converts itself to be, let's just say, more dyslexic friendly. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, because because the, 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 the morals within the stories are, I'd like to think, a bit like Winnie the Pooh or whatever, that they're, they're, it's timeless, you know. <laughs> Everyone wants their children to think of others and know how to share and go to bed on time <laughs> and stuff like that. So the, 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 the stories themselves aren't going to go anywhere, I don't think. But how we consume them is the next is the next kind of nuts to crack. And although I think that you know, anyone can go online and buy a copy of the book or you can buy copies of anything via Amazon or any other good book sales, sales companies out there um, but it's it's the accessibility I think I mean we live we live, we live in an age don't we where information is more accessible than ever than ever in history so how how can we how can we how, or how can I harness that to make it um, make the, my stories and even other people's stories more accessible yeah and, and you can Oh, could almost be. I mean, just something you said there it almost triggered an idea where you had this sort of augmented reality thing where the kids are using their iPad with the book, yeah. but they're having a conversation with Bobby and Morph, and that's done through artificial intelligence. So, yes. uh, you know, maybe asking the characters questions or, uh, uh, you know, digging deeper into some of those topics and subjects, uh, because there's only so much you can cover in a book, particularly a children's book. Uh, but then, uh, as you said, having other, uh, you know, Contextually relevant, contextually relevant ways that kids can interact with books. Uh, I think it's exciting. It's it's uh, it's the next generation, oh, right? And and uh, I mean the, the like I said, the things that I, I'm looking at already is is building building these these tools that you guys know, quite like to say but that kids can not only just be kind of told to. You know, just not just saying this is the story and you read this and that's it, but also that live interaction, which is absolutely key to to 
to learning and 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 to having those messages really hit home and get a full understanding of what they mean <coughs> excuse me so um i'm looking at ways of uh yeah how, how can we interact with the characters can you maybe make up your own stories yourself using using the ai technology that helps you mold stories there's no reason why not while it, you know if a child wanted to put if, if your grand grandkids wanted to put your two dashens into a bobby and morph story do they want to meet bobby and morph how do they do that they can use that and and it's harnessing the power for good i know it sounds very cheesy but it's but it's I think with this new wave of technology coming forward, it's about embracing it and seeing how we can use it for good rather than saying, oh my God, the robots are going to take over the world. <laughs> yeah, spot on. And, and it's, there's no question, like technology has enabled us and will continue to enable us to do things uh, faster, better, easier, to, you know, um, help us become more healthy, to, uh, you, like, you name it. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful time to be alive. and. I like where you're headed with the with uh, the books in general, and, and it's how how do you augment that child's learning? So uh, we're not just learning a book and putting it on a shelf or revisiting it once a year. It's just how can this book become a, uh, a an ongoing learning tool? You know, like there are so many so many cool things you can do. Exactly that. I think that, that it's life life lessons, as it were. Life lessons. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, Ross. Um, so you, you've almost touched on this in a way, but are there any new Bobby and Morph books coming out? Uh, what's next for the uh, two uh, the two dogs? Well, uh, yeah, the books are, or well, the story, sorry, the book is already out there for to for people to pick up. Um, yeah, I spoke about maybe t um, turning it into uh, some kind of uh, interactive app is probably the next stage but ultimately I've, I've already had some <laughs> some sniffs excuse the pun but um, <laughs> around uh, having it turned into an animation perhaps but um, which is which is all great and very encouraging but for me for me as the author um, I'd I want to start exploring like I mentioned before maybe some of the more um, difficult and more awkward uh, subjects to tackle. So that could be, uh, I, I wouldn't dive straight in and say maybe, <laughs> maybe loss of a loved one necessarily by somebody dying or passing away, but it could be divorce. It could be, you know, your parents don't live with each other anymore. Um, they could go around bullying um, and stuff like that. But I've, my, my mind is, constantly racing about this because in one, in one moment I think but these are also important models that I think that are certainly more prevalent in today's modern so uh, society and they can also think I'd love for Bobby and Wolf to uh, travel back in time as it were or revisit certain points in history it doesn't have to be ancient history it can be modern history where they explore what's happened why it's happened and how we can learn from it today that that right. kind of that that's why that's where i see it going at the moment but um lots going on lots going <laughs> on <laughs> between an app um speaking to potentially get it into an animation and, and writing a new one but i think i'll um need to set some time aside to actually decide what avenue i want to go down <laughs> Indeed, so so much choice and decision. Uh, a bit of a light-hearted question as we start to round off the podcast. We love to ask this to all of our guests. Uh, if you had a proverbial time machine, speaking of going back in time, and you could go back to your ten-year-old self, what is one piece of advice that uh, Senior Ross would give Junior Ross? Oh, the pressure is unbelievable here because <laughs> you want to give a really witty answer, and and I suppose you want to go. You don't. You don't. I want to say the obvious thing, which is, you know, you take your hundred pound uh, birthday money and put it into a small company called Google and see what <laughs> happens. But I think, uh, uh, what would I call, what was I say to my 10 year old self, I suppose, not to, not to worry as much. I think I worried quite a bit about, um, uh, socially worried. So. I had a, probably had a bit of social anxiety as a, as a kid growing up, which I, I, I didn't recognise at the time, but I don't think anybody else did. But 
thanks to modern modern day standards and and I recognize that now but also to yeah not to worry because what you're doing and what you're interested in is absolutely fine and oh if you want to continue to make up stories and what I've got I found in the loft funny enough uh, last year when I moved house that, um, <laughs> at the age of I think I was eight or yeah, eight or ten I'd written stories and turned them into books and it was it was a bit surreal really because it was kind of oh my god this was probably a path that was always sub in my subconscious you know so I would say to him don't worry we carry on <laughs> That's wonderful. Look, it's good advice and uh, uh, important for many of us to hear that, um, particularly kids. Now, where can our listeners find you online or, more importantly, Bobby and Morph? Yeah, well, um, the, you can visit the website, which is uh, bobbyandmorph.com, and you can find uh, us across social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, if you just search for Bobby and Morph. Wonderful, Ross. We'll put that into the show notes. Uh, again, thank you for your time today. Thanks for your generosity. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, you know, sharing your books with the world. Um, uh, all the best and hope we cross paths again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jamie. Love it. Thank you. Cheers. If you enjoyed the show, please connect with Jamie on LinkedIn or Instagram. You'll find links in the podcast description. Parenting in the Digital Age is sponsored by Skill Samurai, coding and STEM Academy for Kids. Skill Samurai offers after-school coding classes and holiday programs to help kids thrive academically and socially while preparing them for the careers of the future. Visit skillsamurai.com.au.